Hello again and welcome. Recently I made a couple of different videos where I was life cycling the function switch of a few different meters. All those meters had actually been damaged, none of those were functional. My longer term plan was to try to run some kind of test like that using functional meters. And mainly the reason that I want to do that is there's a question that keeps popping up. Basically what people are asking is how long the BM869S will survive. And I think if you're looking at the normal wear of a meter, basically what's going to fail is probably the input jacks or it's going to be the function switch, possibly the push buttons. I suspect the function switch will fail before anything. So I'm not talking about drop testing or transient testing. I'm just saying under normal use, how long would a meter like this survive compared to other meters? So I've been thinking about how to conduct a test like that. And this is going to be our first working meter. This is made by Centec. It's available for free from Harbor Freight. I've ran meters like this for other tests in the past. This one's brand new. Let's see if it'll turn on. So in the previous two videos, all I was doing was taking the meter apart after so many cycles, and then I would inspect the rotary switch. So I ran a test where I tacked a couple of wires onto the back of the contacts, and then I used an external meter to measure the contact resistance while I was cycling it. So I plan to do the same thing with this meter. I tried to think if there was a better way to possibly measure the contact resistance. For example, uh, we could take the meter and apply a short to its inputs and then just have it go to like the 200 ohm setting for example and you could have the meter maybe read its own resistance. But there's a few problems with running a test like that and that's that all the meters are going to be different. Some of them like this one are manual ranging so, you know, you only can read up to 200 ohms. It could be that we want to actually read higher contact resistance. The only thing I thought about doing is using an external meter, like our Bryman here. On this meter, when we're in the milliamp range, you could see we read uh, 1.42 ohms. This is the 200 milliamp range. We get 10 ohms, and then 100 ohms. So it's possible that you could actually look at the resistance this way. So one of the problems with trying to make this measurement obviously is that some meters may not have a current input. Another problem is, is the shunts may not all be the same value. So if you're trying to measure you know something sub 1 ohm and you're starting out with 1 ohms you know it could get very difficult to measure that accurately. So I think really the only option that we have is to go ahead and tack the wires down to the rotary switch. This is a nicer one, look at this. Seems like the last ones that I purchased, uh, there was a small little bead type fuse that was located horizontally in this location. This one actually has a socket. Another thing too is look at the quality where they mounted these two circuit boards together. This is definitely a better looking meter than what I normally run. I think the first thing we're gonna do is take out the battery so during these tests we won't use this and I think the next thing we want to do is go ahead and remove the circuit board we're gonna to have to be very careful not to touch the contacts when I have them apart but one of the things I'd like to show you is that this meter has no grease on the contacts whatsoever so I have seen some meters where it looks like they use possibly a silicone grease right on the contacts themselves. So I'm not really sure what the reason is why some companies will use it in some cases. So to be clear, it's not my intent to try to do an investigation on whether the grease helps the contacts or not or what types of greases would be better for contacts. The only thing I'm really interested in knowing is when the meter is purchased brand new from the factory, how many cycles can this switch survive? So the next thing we need to do is pick a set of contacts that we can use to measure the switch resistance. Alright, so here you can see I've just tacked on a couple of pieces of wire wrap wire. And what I'm going to do is just close the case around these and it should provide enough strain relief to hold these in place. So when I was looking to select which contacts to use, I was looking for a set of contacts that would be active over a quite large range of motion. So what I end up doing is on this particular meter, there's a set of contacts that are used just for the DC input. So these contacts are active over this entire range. Now this meter doesn't have any dead stops. 
so I can actually rotate this 360 degrees. So what I'm going to do is I will just rotate it back and forth like I would with the normal meter. And then when the switch is in this DC range, then we'll go ahead and take the measurement. You can see I have our Brahmin attached to our little test points. And basically we're reading 1 meg. Till I get to here, and you can see we are reading somewhere around 0.3 ohms. And that appears to be our contact resistance for this. Next what we'll do is go ahead and mount this thing into the test jig, and we can begin cycling it. You can see I have the meter set up in our test jig. It's basically held in place by this small phenolic block. You can see I'm using our little tuning fork and I have our little rubber tubing here to mimic our fingers as we rotate the switch. This cable here goes back to our bench meter that's going to be measuring the resistance and I have a small M drive stepper motor that's going to be turning the forks. So I've updated the software that I'm going to use to run this test. So let me go ahead and show that to you. So this is looking at the post-processing part of the software. So I've gone ahead and ran another meter that I damaged during my transient testing and I've collected that data using this test fixture. So let's go ahead and load that up. So the vertical is looking at the resistance and in the horizontal you can see this is the number of make break cycles. So for this particular meter I cycled it about 57,000 cycles. And to be clear one cycle is going from off to on and back to off. That would be one full cycle. So we can see that the amplitude of this is zoomed in to roughly 2 ohms. We can zoom this out further. Let's just put 1,000 ohms. And what you see at these real high peaks, this is where the switch is actually opened up. So the switch started to fail way down in here in this location. Let's just go ahead and we'll zoom into that again. Now you can see there's a little bit of offset here. And some of that's going to be because of the resistance of the leads. What I'm looking for is an increase in the resistance. I can null out that effect. I can just hit the null switch here. Basically what that's doing is looking for the minimum point and then subtracting off that baseline. So if we considered 1 ohm to be our failure point, you could see the switch only made it to about 2,000 cycles. That's not very much, I don't think, for a switch like this. Again, if you're using the meter, you know, continuously throughout the day, you know, I could see the meter being switched at least, you know, four or five times a day, maybe more. And if you've got a meter that, you know, you run it 180 days out of the year, and it, say it lasts for 30 years, it's quite a few cycles. So this is why I'm testing these switches up at, you know, so many cycles. A lot of people talk about how they'll have a 30-year-old fluke, and those meters are just fine still after 30 years. You know, a friend of mine had given me a Fluke 189 recently that I'd taken apart and cleaned all up. I could tell you that the switch on that thing just looks immaculate. So I could believe some of those meters, like those early U.S.-made Flukes, would survive 30 years without a problem. Another thing we can do with this software is look at the distribution of the resistance. So this is a histogram across the bottom here. This is the total resistance. Looking in the vertical, this is how many measurements fell into this range of resistance. So most of the resistance readings fell right into this peak area here. Let's just zoom into this a little bit further. So you can see now that I've changed the number of bins to 2,000. So that's basically taking the resistance from 0 to 10 ohms, dividing that by 2,000 segments, and then we go ahead and see how many of them fit into that bin. So that's why the peak amplitude here drops quite a bit, and we get a little bit smoother graph. So if the switch were brand new, we'd expect a very sharp peak. But as it wears, the resistance is going to continuously increase. And this is why we see this tailing effect. So another thing we can do is look at this data in three-dimensional. So this is looking at from 0 to our 57,000. So if I slice this into equally spaced segments, and then I overlay that on top of each other, we can get a 3D representation of what that wearing looks like. So here we can see the switch is doing quite well in the center point. And here, where we start out, it looks pretty good. And we can see then towards the back, this is where it really starts to get bad. So this is looking at the main program that's going to be used to run the test jig. And again, you can see it has that post-processing software built into it. 
So this will keep track of the number of make break cycles and the current resistance. So here, this is the histogram plots that I just showed you. Same thing with the 3D and the 2D plotting. So the next step is to go ahead and set this test up and get it cycling. So initially I tried to cycle the switches quite fast. Problem is, is that I actually build up enough heat into the plastic where the plastic started to melt. Uh, so we want to stay away from that. So I'm cycling these switches quite slow when I'm running them. So all we have to do now is just wait for about 50,000 cycles and then we'll see how the switch turns out. So I was originally planning on cycling all these meters up to about 50,000 cycles. Unfortunately with this particular meter, it's basically opened up at about 15 or 10,000 cycles. So I've gone ahead and stopped the test as you can see. And I think what we're going to do is just go ahead and take the meter apart and have a look and see how the switch is done. You can see all this white powder around the outside perimeter. At about 5,000 cycles I started noticing this pretty bad. You can see it has a little bit of red hue to it. You can see that that is down inside of the case here. Look on the back side. See in the center. So I've gone ahead and cleaned up the Centec meter. Let's just see if this thing works. And you can see we're in the DC volt mode right now and it's still reading and open. And I believe this is because of the erosion that you're seeing around some of the vias. So the fact that they placed the vias in the center of the pads where the wiper is running and I believe that that's basically just cut some of those vias through and rendered the switch permanently open. So there's no cleaning that you're going to be able to do with this to recover it. You could possibly add some solder into some of those vias and reattach them to the pads and maybe get the meter to work again for a while. <clears throat> really it's just a bad design. They just shouldn't have placed the vias in the center of the pads like they did. It's a little difficult to get any good pictures with this camera so what I'm going to do is just use the microscope and I'll attach those to the video. All right, the next meter I'd like to run is this Gesundtest ZT-102. Now, I had looked at one of these earlier, and I had actually cut a trace on the back side of the board. That meter was damaged prior to me running the test. So this meter is brand new. I had purchased this at the same time I bought this one, which is the one that's actually survived the 14,000 volt transient. So I don't want to run this one because it's been modified so much. But this one I haven't done anything with. So what I'm going to do is just repeat the same test that I just ran on the Centec, and then we'll see how these two meters compare. So again, when we run this test, we won't use the batteries. This will show up, but this one's a little unique. You can see there is a very small amount of grease on this just a slight amount it's almost like somebody just took their finger and rubbed it in the grease and then just took a quick swipe across the circuit board now this meter is a little different than the Centac in that they're using the rotary switch to turn the power on and off again we have to be very careful that we don't disturb any of the grease 
the idea is that we don't want to do anything that's going to affect our test results. Alright, so here you can see I've attached our two wires. One is just on the positive side of the battery terminal and the other one is going to the positive side of this capacitor. So when the switch is in the off position, these two contacts will be open in any other position. These will be shorted out. It'll be difficult to run the wires out, I'm afraid, through this little joint here. So I'm thinking what we can do is run these through the back battery cover. After I attempted to close the lid, it's just a little too tight. What I don't want to do is put any kind of a bind on the mechanics of the switch. So instead I just routed our test leads out through the little slot here. Really I don't even think we need the cover in here but you can see we can go ahead and zero this out if we want and give us a better idea what that contact resistance really is. Looks good. So I'll go ahead and set this up in our test fixture and we'll start cycling. So you can see I've changed out the fork for the narrower one. That should work a little bit better for this meter. I think we're good to go. So the next step is just let her cycle. We've just finished putting 50,000 cycles on the ZT-102. Let's go ahead and have a look at it. I can tell you that the knob is quite tight on this now. It's squeaking. There's not any real signs of dust along the edge like the first meter we looked at. I don't see any dust or anything on the inside of the case. Go ahead and have a look underneath the circuit board. That's bad. Look at our contacts. Those are some pretty deep grooves it looks like. Cause it's really damaged all the points on the wiper contacts as well. Let's take some pictures of this underneath the microscope. After running our first two meters, I'd like to run something that's a little better class. So I've got my flukes out. Obviously we can't run the Fluke 97 because there's no rotary switch. On the right you can see I have my Fluke 189. This is a meter that a friend of mine had given to me. And this meter is quite old. I took some time and cleaned it all up. Yeah, I don't have any intentions on running this meter through a destructive test. 
So that really just leaves our four meters here. The Fluke 101 has never been a part. Of course, this meter has survived some pretty big transients. It's fully functional. Actually, all these meters are fully functional. The Fluke 107 was damaged during transient testing, and while it works fine, I damaged some of the pads that are on the rotary switch. So I'm not sure if there's enough damage that it would cause this thing to fail prematurely or not. The 115 has never been damaged. Uh, the switch on this is in very good condition. And the same thing with the 17B+. Plus. This meter was damaged during transient testing, but the rotary switch on this is in very good condition. And from a cost standpoint, this is certainly the most expensive of the four flukes. The Fluke 97 and the 189 were both made here in the United States. These four were all made in China. I have a friend of mine who has the Fluke 115, and his is actually produced in the United States. This is a little newer meter. We can see down here it's designed in the United States, but this was definitely made in China. We can see that on the back of the box. Made in China. So at some point they started outsourcing these as well. Just looking inside of our 17B+. Plus. So when I was transient testing this, I damaged, I think it was this op amp here. And it seems like some of the clamp diodes down in this area may have also been damaged. Yeah, this has definitely been resoldered here. You can see the solder joints are just a little shinier than the rest of them. You can see there's a little bit of lubrication. But from what I remember, that is not on the contacts. Let's have a look. Yeah, this is very dry. Looks like it measures about 0.13 ohms or so for the contact resistance. And when it's open, there's 2.77 meg. It'll be fine. See this fork is a little too narrow for this knob. Have to change this out for the bigger one. This will work just fine. Looks pretty good. 17B Plus has now been running about 49,000 cycles. That's non-stop. You can get an idea what this switch sounds like compared to the last Sun Test meter that I ran. I can tell you personally, I can't really tell a difference what it sounds like now compared to when I first started the test. The little bit of white that you see on the dial, this is actually rubbed off of our little pieces of tubing here. That's not anything from inside of the meter. Alright, we just finished running. 50,000 cycles with this meter. Give you some kind of idea on the speed of these tests. That took about two and a half days of non stop cycling. Uh, this test is not fast by any means. Part of the problem if you cycle the switch too fast, I found that I could build up some heat inside of the plastic and I actually started to distort the plastic. So I used my thermal camera, I look at the dial while it was cycling, and I slowed it way down to, you know, basically what you're seeing. It's about a cycle every three to five seconds or so is what I'm doing. And basically that's slow enough where I don't build any heat inside of the switcher, not enough to actually cause any problems. 
you can see I had routed the wires just underneath the little battery clip. You can see that's exposed and goes right down inside. Again, the idea is I didn't want to put any kind of a strain on the case itself. I've had people post about the 17B Plus and how it's not worth the money. You know, my opinion, you get what you pay for with a lot of these meters. Then again, I've seen a lot of very costly meters do very poorly in my transient tests. So it certainly doesn't always work out. You notice that I had attached our test leads down inside of the vias real close to the switch. The reason I did that is they didn't use the vias inside of the pad like some of the real cheap meters. Uh, so they actually route a trace off of the pad and then go to the via. So this is a lot better designed in the first place, so I wasn't so concerned about building heat and damaging the switch contact. Let's clean up our mess here a little bit. Now let's have a look. Well, I don't see any signs of any problems. You can see the rotary switch doesn't have any debris in it at all. Yeah, it looks in very good condition. I can't even tell this was cycled. It's pretty good for 50,000 cycles, I'd say. see any kind of debris around the switch. I guess the key though is what the contacts look like. Let's have a look. Wow. Look at this. I mean, you can tell it's been cycled, but that looks very good. You can see the contacts have just made basically just some shiny spots here. And that is really all I see. You know, there's some slight rubbing on the pads that you would expect. But, I mean, no deep gouges or anything. I mean, really, I would have no problem taking a swab, cleaning this thing up a bit, and continue using this meter. So I think what I'm going to do is just very carefully put this thing back together so we don't disturb any of this. And... I'm just going to let the meter sit. And if I end up running another meter that does this good, maybe we'll extend the testing on this and cycle it even further. So far I haven't seen that. Uh, the previous two meters, of course, those were pretty cheap. Uh, didn't reach anywhere near this number of cycles before we start damaging the switch. <laughs> well, there you go. The Fluke 17B+. Plus. $130 versus you know a free meter and a you know twelve to fifteen dollar meter. This meter did pretty good I would say. You can see this has changed slightly. Let's go ahead and we'll add our waveforms. So this very top one called baseline. Uh, UL means that it's unlubricated versus like the ZT102. You can see it says L for lubricated. The Centec is obviously unlubricated and the Fluke 17B Plus was unlubricated. Looking at the vertical axis, this is an ohm, so zero ohms is the lower left, and we go up to a thousand ohms. Looking across the horizontal scale, uh, this is the number of make-break cycles. And again, one cycle is complete rotation of the knob from one direction to the other and then back again. So let's just have a look at the baseline versus the Centec meter. This will rescale from 1 ohm down to 0. 
and it'll also clip the horizontal to the minimum file length. So in this case you can see I aborted the Syntec meter at basically 17,385 cycles. The only thing we can do is null this data out. So what I'll do is take the least significant point out of this entire data set and then I'll subtract that off of the baseline. So you can see that'll bring the data sets down to zero. Of course our Syntec had already reached zero over here where I turned it off. So if I want to null out the Syntec, I'll basically zoom in a little bit farther and then I can re-null and you'll see it brings the peaks right down. So let's have a look back here where the switch starts to fail. So this is after basically 500 cycles right here. And you can see the Syntec meter is already approaching 1 ohm. Now our baseline meter is doing pretty good. You can see that has about a 0.2 ohm increase and that's after about 300 or so cycles. So let's compare that with the Kassun test. You can see the Kassun test down here is the blue trace and it's basically flat. And we can scroll through this and you can see right about here this is uh, 600 cycles or so and it increased about uh, 0.05 ohms So the Kassun test definitely outperforming these other two cheaper meters. We start getting out to right about here. We can see it's at uh, 0.3 ohms almost that it reaches at about 3,000 cycles. Let's go ahead and we'll turn off our baseline trace. And here we can start to see it reaching over 1 ohm. And this is at 3,500 cycles. So let's turn off our Syntec. I'll re-auto scale. So again, this is our Kassun test meter, but we're zoomed in. Now let's enable our Fluke. And let's go ahead and re-null the data. So let's go ahead and disable the null. And you can see the Fluke meter has slightly lower resistance than what the Kassun test did. And I guess that's not too surprising. So let's uh, slide through this data a little bit now. You can just see how flat that fluke is compared to the Kassun test. So as good as the Kassun test is compared to the two previous meters that I had looked at, you can see the fluke is just far superior. So let's have a look. We'll just bring up our 3D plot again. Again, this is looking at our baseline. This is our Kassun test meter. Again, you can see it starts to go bad right in this area here. This is looking at the fluke. And you can see it's basically flat. Look at the scaling here. And again, this is our Syntec meter. So another way we can look at the data is to plot the histograms. So again, this basically gives you some idea how the switch is wearing. You can see our baseline meter. Again, the peak is quite wide as the meter begins to fail. You can see our Syntec meter in red has a very high peak out here at 1 ohm. Again, we've clamped everything in an ohm. And that meter did quite poorly, so it started failing prematurely. So almost all of the data is one ohm and higher. You can see if we kind of push down into this a little farther. You can see there's hardly any samples down in this area for that Syntec. It's almost all in one ohm and above. You can see our Kassun test has a very high peak at the low, but then it starts to tail off. The interesting one here is looking at the fluke. Basically, all the data resides right inside of this area here. It's very tight, and that's just because the switch is that stable compared to the other three meters that I looked at. Another way that we can view this data is to look at it in a log-log curve. So essentially what this graph is showing is the resistance again across the horizontal axis, and then the number of make-break cycles in the vertical axis. And both of these are in log scale. So if we look at 0.03 ohm, so this is 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03 here. 
and we follow this up we can see we're at 10 cycles 20 30 about 40 cycles up is where that meter actually hit the 0.03 ohms of deviation obviously the higher up in the number of cycles before we reach those numbers the better the meter is and that's certainly what we're seeing with the fluke up here uh, we ran that meter for 50,000 cycles and you can see it's basically a flat line across that and that's because the switch contact is just that tight so again looking at the Cassun test meter which is the blue trace if we look at where it reaches 100 ohms that would be this and we follow this up this would be 1000 cycles here there's two three four right here and I have a cursor we can slide this down onto the point that we're interested in and you can see we've reached 100 ohms in 45 50 cycles so not as good as what you would expect you know the reality again is that if the switch is being used for the on off uh, 100 ohms the meter is not going to be able to power up it's already going to be quite intermittent uh, you would really want that on off switch to be sub 0.1 ohms you know so when we start looking at the life then basically all these meters are going to be sub you know 3000 cycles before they start to fail hopefully this gives you some idea how you could run a test like this my plan in the future is to run some different meters I don't think that we'll have to necessarily spend the time to run all 50,000 cycles. I think what I would do in the future is if a meter goes open or reaches, you know, 1,000 ohms, for example, I would just abort the test at that point because the meter, in my opinion, at that point has already failed. I don't think it would take too long to run a test like this for the majority of the meters that I would look at. It would really just be the quality meters that would take the time. So what I'm planning to do again is just keep that Fluke 17B Plus intact. I'm not going to touch it again. Uh, I've verified that the meter is still functional. It works fine. Again, I'll just pack that away. And if we run into another meter that has a switch that wears as good as that one at 50,000 cycles, what we can do is we can run that Fluke another 50. And we can again compare that against the meter that we're testing. And again, that'll just give us some kind of an idea how the various meters compare. Well, I think that's going to be it. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I'd like to welcome all you new followers. Till the next test. Later.